So friends, this is our last Sunday in Lent. And so next week we have Palm Sunday and then we have Easter. So we're coming to the close of this season here soon that we call Lent. Now Lent is a time where we enter into it and it's a time where we're turning our hearts back to God. Where we're repenting, we're turning away from those things that we cling to in this world and we turn our hearts to this one who can heal us. Now, we do that not because it's an obligation, not because we have to, but we do that motivated out of the love that Jesus has for us. You see, God loves you so much. Did you know that Jesus loves you? Did you know that? We live our lives sometimes not acting that way. But Jesus loves you. He's treasure to us. He is dear to us. But more than that, we have our identity and purpose in Him. Because He loves us. So the more that I am embraced by the love of Jesus, the more I find myself loving Him, you see. The more I turn my heart away from the things of this world and towards Him, which is a daily struggle for us, but the more we turn our hearts to Him, the more we're embraced by His love. And, and the more we realize how good He is. I just love Him. I love Him so much. And I love Him because He loves someone like me. And He loves someone like you. So in this week, the last six weeks of my life have been filled with a lot of pain, suffering, loss. I mean, maybe, maybe more than I've seen in a big chunk of my life. The last six weeks have been inundated with people who've lost everything in their lives. Lost possessions, jobs, identity, what they thought was identity. So many people who've lost so much. What do you say to someone who's lost everything? And, and it's not just the loss that we've seen in Mexico Beach from a hurricane, or here in Nebraska and Fremont or Valley from the loss of home and possession and even jobs. But it's the loss of health. There's the loss of affliction from others. Harm that's been done to so many. These last six weeks have been filled with people who've experienced such great loss. And i got to say, in maybe a way that seems uncharacteristic in my life, I've really felt affected by it. It's actually been a kind of a challenging six weeks. You know, we were in midweek class this last Wednesday, and I found myself on Tuesday and Wednesday feeling just really sad and discouraged, affected by loss. And I came into our midweek classes, and this was my last night with seventh grade, and our last seventh grade class came in, and they said, Pastor Chapman, how are you? A couple of students, and I said, not so good. And they said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. I just feel sad. So, you know, several of those students hugged me. And then I sat down in a way for me that was kind of uncharacteristic where I sat down with them and I said, you know, we've been pushing knowledge in your head all year. And that's great. But I don't really care about putting stuff in your head. What I care about is, do you believe this in your heart? Do you know that God loves you? I mean, truly, totally, completely, that He loves you. Do you believe this in your heart? We had a beautiful conversation, but these kids shared all these things that were way beyond themselves, you know, for seventh graders. The things they're experiencing, the things that they're struggling with, loss that they know of, loss in other people's lives. What do we, what do, we do, they asked me. When a friend has lost or has been afflicted in certain ways, what do we do? Well, thankfully, God really cared for me this week in this passage of Scripture. He speaks to us. If you know what it's like to experience loss, if you find yourself maybe right now in your life where you feel worried, anxious, afraid, where you're experiencing some kind of grief or pain or hurt or loss, 
or you've been harmed in some sort of way, Jesus knows what we need. And he speaks to us through his word. And I'm so thankful for his word that came through Paul to the church in Philippi. From Paul to the church in Divine Shepherd. From God to each of us, this word today. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 as he's speaking to this church who, who needs to be encouraged about challenge and loss. Maybe we do too. He's speaking to them. And he's saying, he's saying you know, I'm a person that has, if anybody has room to boast in accomplishments, it's me, Paul. Because I, I come from the, the right group of people. I've accomplished all these things. I've been trained up in the right way. He was a man of power and position and only climbing. He says to us that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. He came from the right place. The tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was the man. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, he was part of their crew. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. This guy was it. If ever there way, was a way to achieve righteousness on your own, Paul was saying, I have room to boast. I have some confidence in myself. But here he goes in verse 7, and now this is where he breaks it down and where God encourages our hearts. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What happened to Paul that would change his heart in this way? Where he would stop clinging to the things of this world, stop looking to himself and who he was and his accomplishments, his identity and all these things, worldly things, instead having a, an identity formed in Christ, what changed in his life. We know the story, right? Acts chapter 9. Paul was called Saul. Saul was persecuting the church. Saul was marching out to the city of Damascus to find anybody like you who is a Jesus follower so he could imprison them or persecute them. On that way, on that journey, on that road, Jesus Christ encountered his life. He took away Paul's or Saul's ability to see. He sent him into the city of Damascus where he stayed for three days without sight, without food, and he waited per the instructions of Jesus Christ whom he had been persecuting. As he waited, God raised up a fellow follower of Jesus named Ananias. And he sent Ananias, this is one who would have been persecuted by Saul. He sent Ananias to Saul, to the house where he was staying. And perhaps he was worried about this man. He knew what kind of man Saul was. But he went with nothing other than Jesus Christ. He was sent only, I say only, but he was sent with everything. He was sent with Jesus Christ. So he went into the house and he laid his hands upon Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus Christ whom you encountered upon the road has sent me to you that you might receive sight in the Holy Spirit. And Saul did. And immediately he was baptized. So what changed Saul's life? Jesus Christ. And God used Ananias, sending him with only Jesus into Saul's life to share this good news. And these scales of disbelief fell from his eyes. And I, I think that's how it is for you and I. You see, Jesus reminds us that as we experience challenge and hardship and loss and sacrifice and we experience suffering, that he is not apart from that. He is with us. And for me, that's everything. So Paul goes even further. He says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. He uses that word garbage, rubbish. Even the King James says dung. 
A hard word. He's using a hard word to show that nothing, 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 nothing compares to knowing Jesus Christ. More than that, to be known by Jesus. Nothing, nothing compares. So he knows this. And this is a guy who experienced loss because think about it. He had it all in the worldly standards. He was the guy. He had all the confidence. And yet he lost it all. And for him, the loss was gain because he had a treasure that could never be taken away. This is where we find ourselves. This is where you are at today. You have a treasure that through these things in life, ups and downs, good, bad, sad, all these things, you have an anchor for your soul in Jesus Christ. You have a treasure that cannot be taken away from you ever, no matter what. Jesus is with you. So these six weeks have been challenging. Started with a team of us going to Mexico Beach. And this is a picture of my friend, Pastor David Gieseking of Living Water Lutheran Church in Mexico Beach. He was at the epicenter of the storm just six months ago. Hurricane Michael came through and devastated that community. Now, David, this is a picture of his site where he was, where we were standing as a team working with him. That's what it looks like. This is David's home, what's left of his home, just merely a wall. So in this storm, David lost his house. He lost, he was even talking about the things like his, his books and his pictures and, you know, all these things um, gone. The foundation of the church, where the church used to be, the fellowship hall, where they would do Bible study each week, where they would have services if they couldn't be out on the beach, that was all gone. And as we came on the property, it was as if the storm had just come through because it was just a disaster, a mess. And we, we literally moved thousands of pounds of sand trying to level out the grade of the landscape. We chainsawed all kinds of trees. We hauled off tons of debris, chunks of concrete, all kinds of mess. Why would he leave it in such a disarray? You know, what we discovered, I was thankful. We worked with many homes and many different people, but I was most thankful to join this fellow brother. What we discovered is that David, Pastor David, is a wounded healer. So he himself has suffered all this trauma and loss and pain, but at the same time, he can identify with all those who have lost around him, and he's pouring out amazing care but he himself is wounded. So his property was a reflection of where he found himself. Wounded and hurt and pouring out to all others, not able to pour into his own property. So it is that God would send these 28 people to pour into him. So as we worked on his property, they, a, tent, a tent arrived on that very day that we arrived. He wasn't sure when it would come. It came on that very day. Actually, just as we were pulling up to the property, the tent was dropping down from the truck as if God was saying, here you go in the perfect timing. We helped raise this tent. We didn't have instructions how to do it, but thankfully we had a good engineer who told us what to do. We raised this tent. It's still standing today, and now it's a place for them to gather for worship and study. As we cleaned up this property, as we cleaned off the sidewalks and uh, unveiled where the parking lot used to be, uncovered all this mess, it began to look beautiful once again. And it looked so nice that David had the courage to, to host a community barbecue. He asked if we'd help, and we said yes. And so, with the help of the funds raised from people going, we bought him a grill, we bought some food, we helped him do a barbecue, and we blessed the whole community with this barbecue. Some of the younger among us, or the young at heart, ran up and down the street on the newly shoveled out sidewalk. They ran back and forth with signs, and people were honking and waving and stopping and talking. And it was beautiful, the picture of one day to the next, from desolation and destruction to a place of vibrancy. And what changed? What changed that place? The hands and feet of people that were sent by God. 
to encourage and lift a fellow brother. We believe full well that God sent us there, that Jesus sent us into his life to lift him, to restore him, to pray for this wounded healer. So this week, as I was feeling so discouraged and so down and sad, seventh graders really lifted me back up. But in the midst of that, what I realized is that I I think that God was teaching me a lesson. One, maybe just in small measure, what it feels like to be my friend, Pastor David, who's a wounded healer, who's affected by all this loss around him and struggling to have people pouring into him. What that reminded me of is the need for us to pray for people like that, who are in the midst of suffering and the need of care. So I want to encourage you to pray for my friend, David Gieseking, Pastor David, that God refresh him, restore him. God reminded me to pray for him. How often do we see that as a last resort, to pray for another? It should be the first thing we do. That's actually what I talked with the seventh graders about. When someone is struggling, you pray for them. It's not your last resort. It's the first thing you do. Because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the presence of Jesus. We pray. So so God encouraged me to pray for my friend. That was a good reminder. But more than that, God maybe just for a moment gave me a glimpse of his heart. When we are afflicted, when you suffer, when you experience pain or worry or loss, the heart of Jesus suffers as well. From Luke chapter 7, Jesus encountered this woman who was a widow who lost her only son. That meant she was losing all of her worldly you know, care, but also these people that she loved. So Jesus, when he saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. He raised her son back to life. The heart of Jesus goes out to us when we hurt, when we're suffering. In other words, Jesus is not absent from our suffering. He cares deeply. And I think maybe he just showed me a little picture of that. When my heart was aching for people who have lost, the heart of Jesus aches for you. Whatever you're experiencing in your life, Jesus' heart, his heart aches for you. He cares for you. And do you know how I know that? Because in this season of Lent, we acknowledge that Jesus suffered for us that we might be healed. Jesus knows what it's like to hurt and suffer, and He did this for us, and His heart aches for us when we hurt. Here's a picture of a guy named Gary. Gary was one of the houses, a member of the church. We worked on his house. We helped him build this ramp. Some of our team, half of our team split off, worked on his house. I hadn't even seen his place. But some of our team members were working there. They built this ramp. They worked on fixing his modular home. They did all this stuff that he could just never do for himself. And so after days of working there at this barbecue, he came and he sought me out because he wanted to thank me for all these people loving him. And he didn't feel like he deserved it, but he was so thankful. And I was able to proclaim to Gary, Gary, God loves you so much. Do you know that? And he's a guy who's lost a lot. He's a guy who pridefully can't do for himself. God loves you so much, Gary. Do you know that? I suppose so. God loves you so much because He would send all these people to pour out their lives for you. Man, He loves you. Jesus loves you so much that He's not afraid to come into the mess of your life. Gary was so touched by this team, by this group of people. But we came because Jesus sent us. Here's another fellow couple that we worked on their property. This was Larry and Mary. We also had with us Harry and Sherry, uh, just leaving Gary. It's all real. But Larry and Mary, the property owners, we came to their property and, uh, and they lived out further away from the city intentionally. 
because they didn't want to be around people. And Larry shared with me the story of his life. As he began to unfold it, he began to tell me how he doesn't, he doesn't trust people. He's been harmed in the past, and so he has a hard time trusting anyone. And he doesn't want to accept help. And he was struggling with us being there. At the same time, at 85 years old, three heart surgeries, almost dying a couple times, he realized he needed us. So I said to this guy, where, you see, the church would never really have an end to his life because he wanted to be left alone. So I said to Larry, I said, man, Larry, God loves you so much. He says, what do you mean? I said, he loves you so much that these 22 people would come all the way from Nebraska to help you. Jesus loves you so much, man. And he goes, huh, okay, maybe. (laughs) You know, and we continued to talk. And he began just, I didn't tell him what to think or what to believe, but I just shared with him, I believe that God sent us to you. And I can't explain the suffering, and I'm sorry for it. I'm sorry for what you're experiencing, but I, but I know God sent us to you because he loves you. So by the end of this, this day, we spent a day just pulling tree, trees, tons of trees, more trees than I've ever seen, piling, and stacking trees, and he did what he could to help. But at the end of the day, um, Larry said to us, he, he was filled with emotions, and he was tearing up, and he said, I know that God sent you to me. Yeah. Larry, Jesus loves you so much. This is Lance. This is a guy, Lance, who was, uh, he stayed in his house uh, during the storm. So when that whole uh, hurricane was hitting, he's just a few blocks from the ocean. You, you go one block down and all the houses are wiped out. Amazingly, his house stood. And he shared with me the story of what it was like to be inside. As glass was shattering, the shards were sticking to the wall next to him as he felt God's hand of protection when he should have died in his house that night, and then as he came out and emerging, seeing the disaster and the mess, he told me how he is, has trouble sleeping each night, how he's afraid any time he hears a storm, all the trauma that he's experienced, and his inability really to have anybody to talk with about it. So as we talked about that, you know, he was a guy that had been in the church and left the church because he got upset about some kind of music they were playing, you know? So don't do that. Don't be silly like that, right? I mean, what he realized through all of this, the same church now returning to bless him and help him. God sending us to you. Beautiful guy. Feeling refreshed. Wanting to return. Even play his guitar in the church again now. Lance. God sent us to you because he loves you so much. Do you hear the theme? Just like God sent Ananias to Saul, God sends us, ones who know of the treasure that we have in Jesus, he sends us into the world to bless, care, and love people. You know, we navigated our way back, coming all the way back in this marathon trip, 24 hours, driving you know, st- straight through from Florida, and as we were coming back, we were met with all the road closures and the flooding, and we saw the implications of that back here in Nebraska. And so a- upon returning home, we got the team settled, we got them dropped off, we went to drop off the three vans, you know, to haul the 28 people in. And at the van rental location, um, my wife and my son, they come and pick me up and they said, would you come with us out to Valley, Nebraska? Um, they had been dropping off school supplies there through a friend, and now they had a bunch of heaters that they were going to drop off there. And I thought, man, I'm just tired. I don't really want to go, but I want to hang out with you, so I guess I'll go with you. So we drove out to Valley, and uh, they brought the heaters in, and I walked in, and I was just kind of, uh, I don't know, I was sort of tired, and I didn't really want to be there. I was just anxious to go home. And so I kind of moseyed around, but as we came into this back room where they were keeping the heaters, there was two guys sitting against the wall, and they seemed a little bit, um, oh, just a little bit out of it. So as my wife was talking, and I was just milling about, um, I, finally, I finally said to the guy who was one of the guys sitting there, I said, do you, do you live here? Do you live close by? 
And he said, um, he said, well, I'm actually a pastor here in this community, and seven of our families have lost their homes. And he began to just tell me a little bit about that, about the impact, and how huge that was. So I said to him, I said, uh, his name is Carl, I said, Carl, um, I haven't slept in 40 hours, I haven't showered in two and a half days, and I believe, though, that God sent me to be with you here today to remind you of how much Jesus loves you and how much he's going to be with you through this and how much he cares for you. I believe that God sent me to you. He was quite emotional as we embraced. God sends us, and he is the source of hope in all troubles. I mean, so what I'm saying to you, having seen a lot of people who have lost everything or who have been touched by loss, the one thing that we have, it's not the only thing or the last thing, but it's the greatest thing that we have that God gives us, the treasure to offer, is Jesus. So we've been working in Valley, we've been working in Fremont, and we've seen a lot of people who've lost a lot of things even on Thursday, we were at a house and with a gal who may, maybe they can't even salvage her trailer. We don't know for sure. But it really has lost everything. The one thing that we have that cannot be taken away is Jesus Christ. It is everything, friends. Stop clinging to things of this world to look for your source of identity or peace or hope. Cling to him. He cannot be taken away from you. He's everything to us. I'll just tell you this, this last little story. While we were working in Valley, the, one of the chaplains with Samaritan's Purse came and talked with me and told me about a woman who lived a few houses down where they were working. And this woman was a terminal cancer patient with a couple months left to live. Her house, you know, being affected by all this, such mess, such disaster, Tragedy, suffering after suffering, and she was one who found herself, you know, outside of the church, resisting the presence of God in her life, and now having lost and lost, here's this whole crew of people to help her deal with this overwhelming mess. And the chaplain was able to share with her about who Jesus is for her, and she wanted to know. So he and his wife spent a bunch of time with her just talking about who Jesus is. And so as he told me the stories, we talked about it, we prayed together and we thank God for sending us to be there for her. Because we know that we have a treasure. Jesus is everything. Paul concludes, and I'll conclude with his words, he says, brothers, And sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.